That's great. Uh, Marisa, um, I'll, I'll let you um, let us know when, uh, when we should start and when uh, it is okay to start the session. I think now is a good time, if an, unless anybody objects. So thank you, Dr. Badawi, for doing this on a weekend. Um, Dr. Badawi is out in Kuwait right now, but he's going to talk about the skin and skin aging. Great, so um, I'd like to uh, thank um, Clarion for arranging this, and uh, I would like also to thank the We Inject team uh, for uh, being uh, tonight with us. And hopefully you are coming out uh, after this presentation with a clear uh, vision about uh, the skin, the pathogenesis of skin aging, and how to design a rejuvenation plan. This is what I'm going to cover today. Uh, please feel free to uh, let me know if there is anything which is unclear or you have a comment uh, during the presentation. It's a casual presentation. I don't have any interruptions um, uh, during the presentation if something urgent. Uh, if not, at the end, there will be a, a small session for questions and answers to make sure that all the questions have been answered. Of course, you can uh, write any questions uh, you might uh, need to be uh, answered at the end of the presentation in the chat box, and I'll review that before um, uh, we end the session. So I will as, also moderate yeah. the chat box just in case any questions come up that are relevant during your presentation, Dr. Badawi. Um, I will jump in. And also, just a side note reminder that there will be a presentation on the 6th. Um, as well, where we're going to be focusing on lips with the TOCL fillers. Marissa, uh, you are going to be joining us till the end, right? I will, yep. Okay. So if there's anything which you need me to stop and comment on or a question which is really uh, 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 urgent, then let me know, okay? Absolutely. I'll mute myself for now. Uh, so today we are talking about pathogenesis of skin aging and how to design a rejuvenation plan. I'm Ashraf Badawi. I'm a dermatologist. Uh, I'm the uh, vice president of the European Society of Lasers and Energy-Based Devices and the president of the European Society of Cosmetic and Aesthetic Dermatology. At the same time, I'm a visiting professor at Szeged University in Hungary and a professor of dermatology uh, at Cairo University in Egypt. Uh, so... When we are talking about rejuvenation, it is really very important to be aligned. Uh, it's important to be speaking the same language and understand what are we talking about. So what is considered as rejuvenation? And this is a question which really um, I realized that it is not that clear for everyone. What is the meaning of rejuvenation? So if you look at Rose McGowan, and this is how she was looking, and then she underwent so many cosmetic aesthetic procedures. And in a few years, she was looking like that. So she has been injected. She has been, uh, you know, doing so many procedures. In many years, this is how she was looking. Uh, we can debate if she's looking better or no, but this is the fact. This is how she's looking today. And this is another example. This is Sylvester Stallone and how he's looking, and now he's looking like this. Uh, everyone touched those people who was considering that they are doing rejuvenation, they are uh, doing an aesthetic procedure, a cosmetic procedure with the aim of improving how the skin is looking. So my question is, when we are doing a procedure in order to improve how the skin is looking, is this considered rejuvenation? This is a question mark. I believe not. I believe that uh, in order to say that we are doing rejuvenation, then we have to do a procedure with the objective of restoration of the structure and the function of the skin. So if we are doing a procedure and this procedure involves restoration of the structure and the function of the skin, this is called the rejuvenation. If you are doing a procedure just to improve how the skin is looking, this is not necessarily rejuvenation. Rejuvenation might improve how the skin is looking. In most of the cases, it is going to lead to improvement of, the, of the, uh, the, the appearance of the skin, but not necessarily. 
every procedure leading to better look is considered rejuvenation, although rejuvenation should be the ultimate goal. Because if you are doing rejuvenation, then we are improving the appearance and at the same time, improving the structure and the function of the skin. And this means that we are doing an anti-aging procedure. In a few years, the patient is going to be, or the person is going to be looking younger uh, because we improved the structure and the function of the skin. We did rejuvenation. So this is something we have to agree on that the goal of whatever we are doing is supposed to be rejuvenation, not only improving how the skin is looking. In order to achieve rejuvenation, it's important to understand the problem we are dealing with. It's important to know what are the criteria of the healthy skin, which we need to maintain or restore. So the characteristics of the healthy skin include smooth. The skin should be smooth. And the smoothness of the skin is coming from the normal keratinization. If the skin is having hyperkeratosis, then it loses the smoothness and then it is not healthy. The healthy skin is firm and this requires abundant, normal functioning collagen and elastin. And it's important to remember that we are losing, we are starting to lose collagen, starting from, from the age of 20. Every year we lose one to 2% of our body collagen and the areas which are exposed to the light, not the sun only, to the light are having double the loss of collagen. And that explains why the quality of the skin in the areas which are exposed to the light is less than the quality of the skin in the hidden areas. Because here, we are losing double the collagen we are losing here. So quality and quantity of collagen and elastin will play a very important role in firmness of the skin. The healthy skin is evenly colored, and this requires properly functioning nanocytes. When we have hyperactivity of the melanocytes will get hyperpigmentation. If we have some lazy melanocytes, then it is going to lead to hypopigmentation and either hyper or hypopigmentation is giving an impression of unhealthy skin. And if this is the case, then we need to do something in order to achieve uh, again, even the current skin. The healthy skin is properly hydrated, which requires intact barrier function. And this is one of the most important functions of the skin which is very much related again to the normal keratinization. So if we have abnormal keratinization, we lose the smoothness, but also we lose the hydration of the skin uh, and the barrier function is impaired. And this is something which we have to pay very important, very high attention for because we can never achieve healthy skin without intact barrier function. And that's why this is one of the main objectives I would like to achieve in any patient I'm seeing, regardless what I'm going to do for, regardless what is the complaint the patient is presenting with, barrier function. The healthy skin is free of medical diseases when the patient is having acne or psoriasis or eczema or melasma. It is a medical disease which needs attention in order to restore the healthy skin characteristics. And finally, the healthy skin is free of environmental induced deterioration. And here I would like to stop for a moment because uh, any client you are seeing is going to ask you, how many sessions do I need of whatever procedure you are going to advise this patient with? So usually my advice for that patient is that as long as aging is a dynamic process, rejuvenation also has to be dynamic. I'm doing laser. Laser, we need three sessions. And they are going to improve the quality of the skin. They are going to tighten the skin. But then after some time, okay, we achieve the, the, the final effect of those three sessions. We need maintenance because we are having degradation and breakdown of collagen and elastin on daily basis of the old collagen. We are having an insult to the skin because of the environment on daily basis. So as long as aging is a dynamic process, rejuvenation should be dynamic as well. Now, one of the most common mistakes I have seen from colleagues and from practitioners in this field is telescopic vision. Telescopic vision means that we are focusing on one tiny thing 
a lot and you are not looking around. This is what you are doing with a telescope. You are looking at the space in order to see a star, but we cannot see what is behind that star. So we want to avoid that. If someone is coming to complain of melasma, melasma is definitely a problem with the melanocytes. So what most of the people are going to be doing is treat the melasma, do something to bleach the skin, to brighten the skin, to decrease the pigmentation, the hyperpigmentation. But they don't pay attention that the skin is not smooth because there is hyperkeratosis and the skin has lost collagen. So firmness is impaired and this patient is having some wrinkles and some uh, large pores. And the skin is not properly hydrated because they have defective barrier function. And maybe they have some other clinical uh, diseases, medical disease, acne or whatever. We pay attention to the melasma only. And we know that we cannot cure the melasma. So this is going to lead to failure and the patient or the client is not going to be satisfied and will keep going from one clinic to another. What we need to do is the holistic approach. We need to evaluate the skin regardless the problem the patient presented with and try to design a program, a plan in order to normalize the skin, to achieve the healthy skin from all the elements, from all the aspects, starting from the epidermis to the dermis, to the, if there is skin laxity, we need to tighten the skin. And while we do that, we need to try to deal with the hyperpigmentation with the best way to do that. This is a very important key. The same applies for someone who's coming to uh, request uh, neurotoxins for the dynamic wrinkles or fillers or a treatment of acne scars or tightening of the skin. If we don't pay attention to everything, the patient will have limited improvement in the problem. Or when we are done with our procedure, when we do the toxins, when we do the fillers, the situation is going to be worse than the beginning when the effect of those injectables are gone. Why? Because we did not do anything to stop the process of aging or to revert the process of aging. So this is a mental status, which I encourage everyone to adopt because when we are working on all those elements of the skin, then we are achieving rejuvenation. And this is what everyone wants, but they don't know what we have in our uh, tools. So it is us who are able to evaluate the skin and evaluate each of those elements and then design a treatment plan accordingly. Fillers and Botox, uh, PRP, microneedling are all good tools, but we have to make sure that we evaluated all those elements and we have something in our plan in order to revert it back as healthy as possible, as normal as possible. When a patient like this uh, used to come to us 10 years ago, and she's asking for fillers and Botox, we used to do that. And then after nine months, after six months, the effect of the filler and the effect of the Botox is gone, and the patient is coming back, and the situation of the skin is not better. Why? Because the process of aging is going on, and we did not inject in healthy skin. There are so many problems. So I do strongly associate my injectable practice with rejuvenation in order to restore the structure and the function of the skin. We need to work on all the layers of the skin in order to restore the healthy structure of each layer of the skin. Let's go through the aging process of the skin. So the skin is the largest body organ and our body, when it ages, there are two important and major changes happening to our bodies when we age. And this is called the biological aging. Number one, we get reduction in the basic substance of the connective tissue. And that's why when we get older, we become shorter because bone is connective tissue and we get bone resorption because there is a reduction in the basic substance of the connective tissue. The second major change is the diminished rate of cell proliferation. And that's why also in the old age, we get slow wound healing. While we are children, the wounds are healing very quickly, but in old age, it becomes much slower. So those are two major changes happening in our bodies and our organs while we age. 
As I mentioned, uh, the skin is the largest body organ, which is subjected to this biological aging. But in the skin, we call this chrono-aging. Chrono-aging means aging which happens with time. Chrono means time. However, this is not the only change or aging type our skin is subjected to. Why? Because the skin is the interface with the environment. So besides the chrono-aging, what we call it also intrinsic aging because it's happening due to factors from within the body. There is another type of aging the skin is subjected to particularly, which is called the photo aging or extrinsic aging. It is called like that because it is happening due to factors from outside the body. Those are two different types of aging the skin is subjected to. We need to understand the pathogenesis and what changes occurring with each of those types of aging so that we are able to select the right tools to deal with it. So let us see the impact of the chrono-aging and photo-aging on both the epidermis and the dermis. As I mentioned, the chrono-aging is a reflection of the biological aging. And with the biological aging, we have reduction in the basic substance of the connective tissue. Do we have connective tissue in the skin? Yes, of course, we have connective tissue. It is in the dermis, which is called collagen and elastin or elastic fiber. So because of the reduction in the basic substance of the connective tissue, we are going to see collagen synthesis reduction and loss of elastic fiber. Due to the diminished rate of cell proliferation, we are going to see that the dermis is becoming thinner and also the epidermis is going to have fewer cells and this will lead to thinner skin. If you want to remember someone who is having chrono aging, remember our grandparents and how their skin is very delicate, very thin, very atrophic. This is the chrono aging. And if we have one objective to treat chrono aging, then it's going to be working on the collagen to stimulate the collagen synthesis in order to regain the firmness of the skin and regain the thickness of the skin. This is what we need to achieve in the chrono aging. What about the photo aging? The photo aging is a protective mechanism. The skin is feeling that there is injury coming from outside the body. So the skin is trying to protect itself by becoming thicker. So we are going to have thicker epidermis, thicker stratum corneum, and this is the hyperkeratosis we are having when we are exposed to the ultraviolet and to all the external factors from our body. The skin is protecting itself by becoming thicker and increasing the corneocytes on the surface of the skin. And this is what we call hyperkeratosis. What about the dermis? The dermis also is becoming thicker with stretched blood vessels to bring more nutrition and inflammatory infiltrate, which are the cells of war. So this is the photo aging. And if I have one objective to treat photo aging, it is going to be dealing with hyperkeratosis because this hyperkeratosis is having very negative impact on the skin, as we are going to see in a few minutes. So just to summarize, chrono aging is called intrinsic aging and we are going to have a loss of collagen and elastin or elastic fibers in the derms, and this need to be improved. Photoaging is due to exter external factors, and that's why it's called extrinsic aging. And uh, the main insult here is the hyperkeratosis, which we need to treat. Now I have a question for you. Is it possible for someone to have chronoaging without photoaging? Can one develop chrono-aging without photo-aging? And the answer is yes. The areas in our bodies which are covered all the time, they are not having photo-aging. They are subjected only to chrono-aging. The areas of our body which is exposed to the light and the environment are having photo-aging. And there is it, no, no possibility that we have photoaging without chronoaging because photoaging actually is accelerating the chronoaging. So for anyone, by the time we are having photoaging, we'll definitely have chronoaging beneath. So that's why whenever we are doing anything to improve the photoaging, it is important also to realize that this client is having chronoaging and we need to, to do something to stimulate the collagen and improve the changes 
which happens with chrono aging as well. Another very important fact to remember is that aging is associated with poor or slow microcirculation affecting the veins, arteries, and the lymphatics. And when we have the slow lymphatic drainage, then this means that there is uh, accumulation of toxic metabolites in the tissue with low level toxicity. And this means that all the biological functions are deteriorating and uh, the, the, the tissue is not healthy, not viable. And that's why it's very important to remember that whenever we are doing something for rejuvenation, improving the structure, it is really very important to do something to enhance the local blood circulation, mainly or particularly the lymphatic drainage. And that's why plastic surgeons who understand this fact, before they send their patients for liposuction, they are going to send them for a few sessions of lymphatic massage for endermology, LPG, those devices in order to uh, improve the area, the quality of the tissue on the area which they are going to operate on. So the downtime is less and the healing is going to be much better. Beauticians who understand this fact are having a small vacuum device in their shop or their office or whatever, in order to enhance the lymphatic range whenever they are doing uh, facials or whatever, because this is improving the biological function of the face and the areas they are working on. So this is something to remember. And we have to always make sure that we are working on an area with good microcirculation and good lymphatic drainage. This is a vital uh, slide today because our skin is composed of three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous fat and tissue. And actually it is really very important uh, whenever we are having a client asking for any aesthetic procedure to evaluate those three layers and any change occurred with aging to any of those layers is it's important to be addressed and we have to communicate that with the client uh, to make sure that they understand maybe they will approve our plan and our recommendation maybe they don't have budget but at least we should do our part examine the skin evaluate the status of the skin, each layer of the skin, and if there are any changes which require intervention to be addressed, and this should be documented in the file that we addressed those issues, we recommended uh, so and so and so, and the patient is going to go ahead with this plan or the patient decline. Why? Because each of those layers are uh, is undergoing certain changes with aging which affects the structure and the function, hence the appearance of the skin. If someone is having dynamic wrinkles and they are asking for neurotoxins, however, when we examine the patient skin, we realize that the epidermal barrier function is not very well. So there is transepidermal water loss, and this is affecting the absorption of the topical agents. It's affecting the viability of the skin and so on. So if they decline, then we are going to inject them with neurotoxins. They are going, the, the, the expression lines or the dynamic wrinkles are going to be gone away. However, the skin is not going to be looking healthy. So it's really very important to realize that because at the end, we are not targeting dynamic wrinkles. We are objecting the improvement of the skin in general. We want this person, when they look at the mirror, to see that their skin is healthy. It is looking great. We want people to, uh, when they meet them, to tell them, what did you do? You look uh, very well. So this is the comment which I like my clients, my patients to hear, and this is happening by this holistic approach. So let us see each of those layers and what happens to them when we age. So when we look at the epidermis, the normal healthy composition of the epidermis is supposed to be like this, 35% corneocytes and 65% living cells. This is the normal healthy composition of the epidermis. With photoaging, as I said, we will have hyperkeratosis. What does hyper hyperkeratosis mean? It means that the corneocytes, which are supposed to be 35% only, are going to increase from 35% up to 60%. 
But when this will happen, it is not going to happen just by increasing the thickness of the epidermis. No, the epidermis is stable with the thickness. So when the conocytes increase, this is going to be on the expense of the leading cells, which are going to be de de diminished from 65% down to 40%. When someone is having this structure of the epidermis, <coughs> They are not coming to tell you I have hyperkeratosis. They don't know what meaning what hyperkeratosis means. They are coming to tell you my skin is looking dull. It is not looking healthy. <coughs> so why? Because we have less number of living cells, and the nutrition is impaired. So this is one complaint they are telling you when they have this structure of the epidermis. Another complaint they will tell you when they have this structure of the epidermis: corneocytes too much, living cells too less. They will tell you I'm using the best skincare products, the best brands, the most expensive brands, but it is useless. I'm not getting benefit of that. Why? Because when we apply any active skincare products on the skin while the epidermis is like that, it is going to be consumed by a thick layer of corneocytes, dead cells which are not going to utilize it. And whatever penetrates, will find less number of living cells to work on. So the effectiveness of anything we apply topically while we have such epidermis is useless. It is very weak. The third comment, those people will tell you, they will tell you, I have dry skin. I have dry skin. And sometimes they will tell you, I have, my skin became very sensitive. I never used to have sensitive skin, but now my skin is sensitive. What's going on? When we have hyperkeratosis, the conocytes are overlapping, they are overcrowded, and this will allow a situation where the epidermal barrier function is lost. So we have some gaps in between the conocytes, and these gaps, just like in the photo here in the electron microscope, will allow the transepidermal water loss, the skin is vaporizing the water. Not only that, but also when the skin is open like this, not like this, like this, this will allow some chemicals and some foreign bodies and foreign materials to go deeper into the skin where they are not supposed to go. And this is going to create uh, an immune reaction and the skin is, become, is becoming sensitive. So because there is uh, epidermal barrier dysfunction. Very important thing we have to remember when we have transepidermal water loss and the skin is losing water, those people are co coming to complain of skin dryness all the time. What we do at that time, we prescribe moisturizer. No, it is not going to help the problem. It is going to be with very temporary and limited effect but the structure is damaged. So we don't expect the moisturizer to work well. The problem is that when we lose the water from our skin, we are losing also the elasticity. And if you want to have a proof for that, this is a very good proof. This is a baby who is having gastroenteritis. When the children are having gastroenteritis, vomiting and diarrhea, they lose body fluids. And we teach the parents at that time that every now and then in this scenario, you have to pinch the abdominal skin. If it did not retract just like this, this is a sign of dehydration and you have to rush to the hospital because this baby requires intravenous fluids. So this is showing us the impact of the skin elasticity uh, or the skin and dehydration on the skin elasticity. So when we have this on the microscopic level, Definitely, there is impairment of the skin elasticity, and this is going to be reflected on three main criteria. This patient is coming to tell you, my skin is not smooth anymore. You remember? Hyperkeratosis. Number two, they are going to complain of fine lines and wrinkles. Number three, they are going to complain of large pores. Why? Because we lost the elasticity. If you just stretch the skin of that person who is complaining of large pores, the pores are becoming smaller. So if we improve the hydration, we are improving the elasticity. And when we improve the elasticity, the skin is going to be stretched and the pores are becoming smaller and the small fine lines are going to be gone. 
and the skin is becoming smoother just by improving the hydration of the skin, by improving the barrier function, by decreasing the hyperkeratosis. So when we have such scenario, when we have such composition of the epidermis, it is very important to remember that we need to do something at the level of the epidermis, keratolytic procedure, in order to decrease the population of the corneocytes. And when we are removing cells from the skin, this means that we are stimulating the regeneration process. So when we do a keratolytic procedure, regardless what it is, we are going to discuss what are the options in a few minutes. But when we remove corneocytes from the skin, this is going to stimulate the living cells so that we are able to revert the composition of the epidermis back to normal within about two weeks from these keratolytic procedures. So this is something we have to remember. And uh, uh, it is really very important to know that every single person you are seeing in your clinic is having this kind of corneocytes starting from the 20s and people coming with acne and later. So for me, and this is an answer for a question Marina sent uh, to me to answer, what is the most popular procedure I'm doing? Epidermal barrier restoration, because this is something which affects everyone. And if I improve the epidermis, everything else is going to work much better, whether it is fillers or toxins or laser rejuvenation or microneedling, the epidermis need to be improved with whatever procedure you select, but it is a vital step in any rejuvenation plan. When we have epidermis like that, it's going to be looking much more viable. The skin is going to be looking more viable. Uh, it is going to be looking brighter. It is going to absorb any topical agent, any topical skincare product in a much better way. And when the epidermis is having good barrier function, then there is no transepidermal water loss. The skin is going to be well hydrated. It's going to be smoother. The pores are going to be smaller and the fine lines would be gone. So this is something which we have to uh, have as an objective in any treatment plan we are going to design for the patient. In many cases, patients are coming to complain of things beyond the surface of the skin. If we pay good attention, we are going to see that the epidermis and the superficial layer of the skin is impaired, and this needs to be prepared in order to have good reflection and good result of anything we do beyond the surface of the skin. If we skip this area, uh, that whatever we do is not going to achieve an optimum outcome. Does it make a difference if you are doing injection in healthy epidermis or no. If I'm injecting fillers and the skin is well hydrated and the epidermal barrier function is working well and uh, the, the skin is having uh, good nutrition, then definitely it is going to be staying longer. It is going to be looking more natural. The, the inflammation which can happen is going to be much better if the lymphatic drainage is better, which I improved before the injection. And uh, it's going to be longer staying if the skin is well hydrated. All those are going to happen if we are working on healthy skin. What about the toxins? If we are injecting toxins in a well hydrated skin with good skin elasticity and uh, better function, then again, the toxins are going to work on dynamic wrinkles and the improvement is going to be very natural and most probably the toxins are going to last longer in the skin. So it makes big difference if you are working on healthy epidermis or no, even if you are injecting uh, uh, whatever uh, botulinum toxins or fillers. And this is something we did not realize till recently. We're thinking someone who is complaining of uh, dynamic wrinkles, let us inject botox and that's it. This is his... Uh, request and this is what we are going to do. And the same was applied to fillers. Today, we have a different set of mind and I think it is much healthier and much better to inject injectables in healthy skin. The dermis is composed of water, 75% water, and this is required to maintain the barrier function, 20% proteins, collagen and elastin, in chrono aging after the age of 20, we start to lose one to 2% of our collagen per year. 
and photoaging can double this loss as we mentioned before. Rejuvenation is a concept which is composed of five cosmetic targets. We need to improve the skin condition and removal of the skin damage. We need to stimulate the cell division. We need to guarantee skin nutrition. We need to improve the cell functions and we need to achieve protection and anti-aging. Unfortunately, as practitioners in that field, we cannot do all the five cosmetic targets. We can do only two. We can do a procedure to improve the skin condition and removal of the skin damage. And usually this is going to be associated with stimulation of cell division. And then our role stops. What about the remaining three cosmetic targets? This is the homework of the patient or the client to guarantee skin nutrition, to improve the nutrition, to enough have enough water intake, to use the appropriate skincare products in order to maintain and improve the outcome of the procedures we did. We need to improve the cell functions, and this is usually going to be attained by using the appropriate skincare products. And we need, of course, protection and anti-aging, which is going to be using the sunscreens, maybe the products which are called, uh, having uh, retinols, so we need protection, otherwise the problem will come back soon. So we have to have a mutual agreement with our clients that we are going to do our part. We are going to do the procedure, but you have a big part of the job on your shoulders where you need to use the appropriate skincare products and the healthy diet and whatever in order to improve and maintain the outcome of the procedures which we did. The objective of rejuvenation should be restoration of the epidermis and changing this kind of epidermis into that one. Working on the dermis where we start to lose the collagen at the age of 20 uh, by doing something to stimulate the collagen synthesis. And we are going to discuss what are those procedures in order to uh, maintain the dermis in good shape and good, uh, uh, good quality. Uh, and also if their skin laxity, we need to tighten the skin because sometimes the patients are not going to, you know, realize everything they have. In the beginning, when I started this practice, maybe 25 years ago, I used to pay attention to the patient complaint only. So if the patient is asking about improving the nasolabial line and something in the face, I work on that. But then I started to realize that after a while, patients are coming to say, we are very happy to, uh, with what you did to our face, but now we have skin, uh, neck laxity. They didn't realize it before because they're focusing on the face. When we improve the face, they started to see the neck and they thought that this happened due to what we did in the face. They didn't realize that it was there from the beginning. So it is really very important to address all the problems the patient are having, whether they realize it or not, and then make sure that we are having a plan for each part. And then if the patient declines, then at least we document that. And if they come back to say, this did not improve, or we, we have a problem with this, we can tell them, we said from the beginning that you have this problem and you declined the treatment plan, which we suggest. So if there is skin laxity, this has to be addressed at the same time while we are treating everything else. From my point of view, Face and neck is one unit. I cannot work on the face without the neck and I cannot work on the neck without the face. This is one unit. We have so many options for rejuvenation like topical preparations, including chemical peels, microdermabrasion, hydrodermabrasion, the new devices like hydrafacial and silk peel and all those devices, tissue augmentation, botulinum toxin injection, skin needling with or without fractional radiofrequency, tissue tightening with radiofrequency or infrared light, laser rejuvenation, which is the non-ablative rejuvenation, and finally surgical procedures. Now, all those are tools, and most probably we are going to be using multiple of them. There is no one single uh, tool of those which are working on all the layers of the skin. So when we have someone who would like to get rejuvenation. Number one, we have to define where is the problem? Which layer are we targeting? Are we targeting the epidermis only or the dermis only or the subcutaneous fat and tissue 
only or combination of all those. So this is number one, where is the pathology? Number two, we need to understand our tools. What each of those tools is doing. So if we talk about microderma bridging, is it working on the epidermis or the dermis or the subcutaneous fat and tissue? Epidermis. So I'm able to improve the uh, epidermis with microderma abrasion, but it's not going to stimulate the collagen. It's not going to tighten the skin. What about laser rejuvenation? Laser rejuvenation is going to stimulate the collagen, but it's not going to tighten the skin and it's not going to improve the epidermis and so on. If I'm doing microneedling, microneedling is going to improve the collagen to stimulate the collagen, but it's not improving the epidermis and it's not tightening the skin. So at the end, we are, when we are talking about toxins, it is doing dynamic wrinkles. It is not stimulating collagen. It is not improving the epidermal barrier function. Uh, it is not tightening the skin, so on. So it is really very important to understand our tools and on which layer of the skin is it working so that we are able to design a comprehensive rejuvenation plan to achieve the, the, the improvement in the quality the structure and the function of the skin in general. This is how we should plan our efforts. So what we are aiming at is three dimensional rejuvenation where we need to target the epidermis, the dermis and the subcutaneous tissue. The dermis we'd like to achieve collagen induction therapy, CIT, and the subcutaneous tissue, we would like to achieve deep tissue heating in order to achieve tightening. So what are the options in order to improve the epidermis? Retinoids, so we can apply uh, topical retinoids. We can do chemical peeling, but we have to prepare the skin well before, and we have to take care of the skin after so that we avoid hyperpigmentation. We can use the microderm abrasion with all the surrounding technologies, uh, like the silk peel, like the hydra uh, derm abrasion, the mesojet, the oxygeneo, the um, um, uh, uh, hydrafacial, all those devices are considered microderm abrasion where it's mechanically uh, removing the corneocytes and at the same time uh, with the vacuum associated, it improves the lymphatic drainage. And also we can improve the epidermis by laser peel, uh, superficial peeling of the epidermis with certain types of laser in order to achieve improvement of the epidermis. What about the dermis? How can we stimulate the collagen? There are also several tools. We can do skin needling. We can do microneedling radio frequency. We can do lasers, whether non-ablative lasers or fractional lasers, and we can do PRP. All those are tools uh, in order to stimulate the collagen. What about the subcutaneous tissue and the tightening? We can use the radio frequency. We can use the infrared light and laser, like the NDA. HIFO can be used which I'm not in favor because it causes a lot of fibrosis below the surface of the skin. Threads can be used in order to achieve lifting, which also I don't like because it's a foreign body and it can induce some fibrosis. And of course, surgery, where we are doing facelift. And also I don't like that very much because uh, at the end, it's not giving the natural improvement. When we do surgery, we get immediate improvement, of course but improvement of what? Improvement of the look. However, not improvement in the structure. We just pulled the skin, but we did not improve how the skin is structured or uh, functioning. So that's why uh, the plastic surgeons who understand this concept, they will send their patients for a few sessions of laser rejuvenation and improving uh, the epidermis and, and tightening as well before they do the surgery because then they will op operate on much healthier skin. So the incidence of scarring is going to be less. The skin is going to be looking much better uh, after the surgery because the structure has improved. So this is a concept which we really need to adopt. From my point of view, any client you will see will have an issue with the epidermis, which needs uh, to be addressed. Uh, most of them are going to have an issue with the dermis, so we need to stimulate the collagen. Some of them will also have skin laxity, which we need to address, not all of them. Just a quick example, if someone is having acne scars, definitely the epidermis need to be improved. And if we improve the epidermis, the acne scars will improve about 15, 
before touching the dermis. The main problem in the acne scar is the dermis. So we need definitely to achieve collagen induction therapy. Do we need to do skin tightening in the patient with acne scars? It depends. If the patient is young, usually there is no skin laxity. <coughs> but there is a small test which we can perform in order to answer that question. If someone is having acne scars, if we stretch the skin, very light stretch, and we find that the acne scars improved, this means that tightening procedure will improve the situation about 15, 20%. So we have to include tightening in the treatment plan. If we stretch the skin and this had no impact on the acne scars, then it means that the skin is not having laxity and there is no point of doing tightening in that patient. So this is going to be a small test to differentiate if that patient with acne scar requires tightening or no. Now, another important thing, which is a very common mistake, Sometimes I see patients coming after going to several clinics before they come to me. And they tell me, we went to four clinics before you and we were not satisfied with the outcome. So I ask them, what procedure did you do? So they say, first clinic, I did uh, dermapen, microneedling. And then we went to another place and we did fractional laser and we were not very satisfied. And after that, we went to a third clinic where they did PRP and we were not satisfied. So we are coming to you. What was the mistake? The mistake is that all those clinics, they did only collagen induction therapy. No one paid attention that the epidermis need to be improved and no one paid attention that this particular patient had skin laxity and if they tighten the skin, it, the acne scars will improve as well. So this is vital that instead of hammering on the same layer of the skin, we need to pick a technology or a procedure which is targeting each of the layers of the skin in order to improve the quality of the skin, in order to improve the structure and the function, in order to achieve rejuvenation. So I think this is a very, very valid concept we need to adopt, we need to think of, and uh, uh, it is going to make huge difference. It did for me, and we are going to see some clinical photos at the end. So this is a patient who came and she wanted some filler injection. So I told her, I told her okay, let us just work on the skin. And we did microderm abrasion. We did laser rejuvenation with a laser called Photona laser where we did 4D, I did laser from inside the mouse to improve the nasolabial line, and then from outside to tighten the skin and to stimulate the collagen. And in one session, after one month, this is how she was looking. I think we can all appreciate that the nasolabial lines improved and the quality of the skin improved. The patient was so happy. And the injection, we keep it for a later uh, stage or the, the amount of fillers, which we might still need in her case is going to be less. So in this case, her tissues are going to be uh, much better looking. And I think we all agree that this was uh, not bad after one session of that. Did you reduce the diamond particles in crust? Uh, uh, usually I use the microderm abrasion. This was the oldest microderm abrasion or the diamond peel. And the objective of that is to do chemical mechanical peeling which is very much controlled, associated with no downtime. And at the same time, the vacuum is going to improve the lymphatic drainage. Of course, things developed after that and we got uh, much more advanced uh, technologies like the silk peel and uh, uh, those devices which are improving the quality of the epidermis. I usually do four sessions once a week. And then after that, I recommend to do uh, a session every three months. So this is the first step to improve the epidermal barrier function. Then we need to achieve collagen induction therapy and microneedling very frequency is one of the techniques where uh, this is the latest advancement in delivery of radio frequency. And this combines both needling and fractional radio frequency. So it started with the derma roll where we used to roll it with this disposable device on the skin after applying the numbing uh, cream. 
and uh, we used to have very nice results by stimulating the collagen synthesis. And uh, the advantage of this microneedling is that it's not associated with heat. So even in um, uh, Asian clients who are very much prone for hyperpigmentation, in this case, we don't have risk of hyperpigmentation because this technique is not associated with heat. And once we are not using heat, then there is no risk of hyperpigmentation, even when the patient is very much pro, uh, prone for hyperpigmentation. We can improve the acne scar significantly without any problem. And again, this is a case where microneedling was utilized by itself, and definitely we can see the improvement. We can use this technique also in treating uh, some uh, post-burn scars, alleviating the tension of the tissue. And uh, in association with the appropriate topical agents, we can improve the quality of the skin uh, significantly. We apply the topical numbing cream, and then we use those derma rollers. We're going to see this pinpoint bleeding, but this is very temporary. After the procedure, uh, the skin is going to be just erythematous. For a few hours, this is in five hours, and we can see that this is a procedure which is associated with minimal or no downtime. We can work on any skin type, so there is no limitations to uh, the darker skin types. It is very safe on all skin types, and we can see that it can improve the acne scars in a very nice way. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm going to skip this, uh, which is the the principles how the microneedling work, but I just wanted to highlight that this was published in uh, Nature magazine, which is uh, actually one of the highest impact factor journals in um, 26. So uh, uh, very long time back, but this was explaining why the microneedling work very well. So the principle here is that inside our cells, we have a negative electrical potential of minus 50 to minus 70 millivolts. This is in the resting phase without any injury, without anything. When we have injury in the skin, they found that there is increase in this negative electrical potential, which jumps up from minus 50 to minus 100 millivolts. And this was a very strong stimulus for the regeneration. So when we get a wound, this is a stimulation for the regeneration so that we get healing. And why this is happening? Because of the jump in the negative electrical potential intracellular. Now they found that when we insert steel needles into the skin, this negative electrical potential will jump not only to minus 100 millivolts, but to minus 150 millivolts. So inserting needles into the skin was found to be a strong, very strong stimulation for the regeneration of the tissue. And that's why microneedling is one of the very effective tools in order to stimulate the regeneration and the collagen synthesis. Actually, this was not the only reason, the negative electrical potential uh, for the efficacy of the microneedling, but also it was found that when we insert those needles into the skin multiple times, this is, uh, is a stimulation for mild inflammatory reaction. And with mild inflammation, we get fibroblasts and fibroblasts are cells from the inflammatory cells, acute inflammatory cells, which are responsible for synthesis of new collagen. So we are going to deposit new collagen into the skin. In addition to that, the insertion <coughs> of multiple needles into the skin will increase the blood circulation in this area. When more blood is coming, it is coming with more growth factors and nutrients. So the viability of the tissue is going to improve. And that's why the microneedling is having very good impact on the skin. So as a summary, the benefits of needling, <coughs> excuse me, is increasing the negative cell potential, increasing the local blood circulation, stimulation mild inflammatory reaction, so fibroblasts will come and will synthesize new collagen. In case of scars and fibrotic tissue, break and fragment the fibrosis. One of the inflammatory mediators generated is an enzyme called collagenase. And this collagenase is going to eat up the fibrous tissue. And that's why fibrosis will decrease. And because of that, microneedling is one of the good tools uh, in order to treat scars. Also, they found that we get increased absorption of topical agents. And this is something which was proven in a thesis in Merburg University in Germany, where they applied some 
liposomes on the skin without needling, and they found that only 0.3% can penetrate the stratum corneum. After that, they performed the microneedling, and they applied the same liposomes on the skin, and they found that up to 200 times more substance can be delivered into the skin. So this means that after the microneedling, the absorption of anything we apply on the skin is significant. So we have to be careful what we apply on the skin after the microneedling. Now, very important point here I would like to raise that in order to achieve good absorption of topical agents, we need a needle depth or length of 0.3 to 0.5 only. But this is not going to induce collagen induction. In order to induce collagen induction, we need the needle to be more than 0.6, better even if it is more than one millimeter in order to induce collagen. So the, the uh, dermarols which are being sold in pharmacies and so on, they are only for home use and they are only 0.3 to 0.5. So those are to enhance the absorption of the creams, the topical agents. They are never going to stimulate collagen. The, those which need to, which are needed to uh, stimulate the collagen, are the professional ones, which should be used in the clinics, and they require very good sterilization of the skin and topical anesthesia before uh, using them. They are going to stimulate the collagen and enhance the absorption of topical agents. So the added benefit Dr. of Dr. Badawi, we just we just have a question. Yeah. Um, Natalie is asking, how long should a client wait between having a neuromodulator or filler and microneedling or a PRP session? So some clients fear having PRP done will make their Botox and filler wear off faster than normal. Is this true? Uh, so the, how long the, between your PRP microneedling treatment and when you get your toxin or filler? Okay. Now, uh, the, the golden rule is that we don't do anything to uh, inflamed or irritated skin. So this is the golden rule in general. So if I did laser today and the skin is irritated um, in one day, two days, three days, I'm not going to do anything else and vice versa. However, with toxins, I prefer uh, to wait two weeks after injecting the toxins because we know that the effect starts in two days and we get the maximum effect of the toxins after two weeks. So I prefer not to do any procedures in the areas I injected the toxin for two weeks after injecting the toxins. This is regarding the neurotoxins. The fillers, I usually prefer to wait for three weeks after injecting the fillers uh, before doing anything because I want the filler to stay, not to be mobilized I don't want to do any procedure which is going to enhance the local blood circulation, which can wash out the filler quicker. So I prefer to wait three weeks after injecting fillers and wait for two weeks after injecting neurotoxins before I do any other procedure. Now, if I did uh, microneedling with PRP today and tomorrow the skin is just normal without any hyperemia, without any redness, without anything, then I can inject the fillers or the Botox. But I don't inject Botox or fillers or butinum toxins um, or fillers in inflamed or irritated skin. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think it did. I think you should always wait for the skin to re-epithelialize before you go in with a new treatment. Yes, definitely. When we do aesthetic procedures, it's not urgent. It's better to wait when the skin is calm and everything is stable and nice, okay? So the added benefit of, uh, there is uh, still a question. Mm, okay, perfect. Uh, the added benefit is it has delivery of topicals like cosmeceuticals. Uh, this is something I'm using um, uh, a lot. After doing the microneedling, we use hyaluronic acid topical in order to enhance the hydration and the nutrition of the skin, biologicals, PRP, uh, after doing the microneedling, uh, we inject the PRP wherever we need to inject, and then we apply a little bit uh, topical as well, which is uh, very nice. Uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, patients who are having uh, melasma, 
uh, after doing the microneedling, we can apply a little bit of um, um, hydroquinone or ranexamic acid or whatever, which is doing very nice results. Here also we can use the mesobotox, where we are mixing the mesotherapy cocktails with some botox in order to improve the, how the skin is looking, the very fine lines, the pores uh, are going to enhance, uh, the, the appearance is going to be much better when we do the microneedling and then uh, uh, apply the, this uh, mesobotox topically. And this is one of the very nice procedures which we perform. Okay, uh, so the fractional frequency is a new concept where RF is delivered either in contact mode or via needles in precise and specific points to exert the effect precisely instead of the bulk heating. And usually we get more reproducible results than the bulk heating and uh, we can definitely see very nice results. There are so many studies which are proving that the bipolar fraction radio frequency uh, is able to induce neoelastogenesis and neocollagenesis. Here, they uh, did study the uh, various wound healing genes involved in dermal remodeling. And we'll talk about fibrin, tropoelastin, procollagen 1, and procollagen 3. And we can see the values in the mean, in the control. And then immediately, there is a slight increase in th those values. However, if we look at 28 days, we are going to see a significant jump in those very important uh, markers, which proves that this is something which is going to stay in the skin for a long time. It's not temporary erythema or temporary edema, which is going to go away. The fractional radio frequency microneedling is having a very significant impact on the skin and it improves the quality of the skin significantly. So this is the pro collagen one, the baseline, and we can see four weeks after the final treatment and the significant improvement in the pro-collagen one and the, the same for another patient. And this is the um, uh, elastin. Uh, and we can see also very nice uh, improvement, very significant improvement four weeks after the final treatment. We can see the fibers. And uh, also the histological uh, uh, study showed that four weeks after the final treatment, there is a uh, significant increase in the collagen content of the skin in two different patients. And this is the elastic fiber four weeks after the final treatment, and we can see the significant jump and increase. So the benefits of needling and radio frequency is that controlled heating, heating of the uh, derms and subcutaneous tissues achieved, enhanced dermal collagen remodeling, immediate change in the collagen structure. That's why we can see immediate improvement and long-term stimulation of neocollagenesis, uh, which starts four to six weeks after treatment. And this means that the, there is long-term improvement. So I always tell my patients that the improvement is going to continue to happen for six months after the final treatment. We have the non-invasive RF and the RF microneedling. Uh, and of course, we don't like needles. However, we have uh, gone through the, the benefits of the needling, and that's why this is one of my favorite procedures. Now, it's very important to realize that the quality makes a big difference. If we have good quality needles, then it is going to be thin, and it's not going to be bending like this. So here are two conclusions. Number one, you have to look for the quality, because if the quality is poor, then this is going to happen. And when we have a hook-like needle, then this is going to cause minute fibrosis and injury in the skin. So it's very important to make sure that you are using very good quality products. The other thing is that those are disposables, whether the tips of the microneedling or the dermarol, this is something which should be used once and thrown away. We cannot use it more than once because with the multiple insertions, there is wear and tear. So even if it's good quality, it can have this effect and then this is not good for the patient and there is no way to sterilize it as well. So that's why those are disposables and I never reuse them even for the same patient. This is the impact of the microneedling uh, radio frequency on the skin, which is very much mimicking the non-ablative fractional laser. And that's why I claim that anything the non-ablative fractional laser can do the microneedling radio frequency can do as well. This is how the skin is looking immediately 
after the procedure. So it's very easy to uh, realize where I treated and where I did not treat. So I can go to the skipped area and uh, treat them. And this is how the patient is looking 24 hours after the treatment. So this is a treatment which, which is associated almost with no downtime. We can treat the static crinkles in the skin with this technique. We can improve the overall appearance of the skin. And this is after one session, this is before, and this is after. And this is the same patient. And we can see the improvement of the wrinkles. We can work around the eye without a problem. And we can see the improvement in this area. With combination treatment, we are able to work on the stretch marks. But this requires really good combination. So we did the microderma, uh, microderma abrasion. We did microneedling with PRP injection and also non-ablative rejuvenation with the NDA. And this was the outcome. Working on the pores, I didn't see anything working better than the microneedling radio frequency. As we can see here, this is a typical improvement uh, in the pores of the uh, patients. Now, uh, they did a split phase comparison between fractional microneedling radio frequency device and fractional carbon dioxide. So one side was treated with the microneedling radio frequency and the other side of the face of that patient uh, or that group of patients was treated with the fractional carbon dioxide. They were both found to be clinically equivalent. So both the microneedling radio frequency and the fractional CO2 were associated with moderate improvement in most patients and the number of active lesion uh, was significantly decreased on both sides. However, the downtime was significantly less with the microneedling radio frequency. And when we are seeing a technique or a technology which is as effective as another one, but associated with significant downtime, definitely this is going to win. So in summary, we can uh, treat acne scars with non-ablative rejuvenation, and we can achieve this beautiful results. Also, we can use the non-ablative fractional laser to improve acne scars. We can use the ablative fractional laser also to, use, to treat acne scars. However, the question will remain, what if someone doesn't have a laser and doesn't want to use a laser and would like to treat acne scars, then the microneedling might be a very good alternative. And we can see that all those are different techniques which are working on acne scars and able to achieve nice improvement. Uh, so uh, it is not one tool or nothing. We have different options and we are going to use whatever we have available, whatever we have expertise with. The important thing is to have a plan which is dealing with the different layers of the skin. Uh, Just going back to a question from a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, Alex asked, how do you deliver micro Botox with a device or by hand? I think she's asking this because there's that meso gold or the aqua yeah. gold on yeah. the market that's not Health Canada approved. Yes. Uh, actually, um, uh, this is something which we do. Uh, I don't. I don't inject uh, with the gun. I do micro needling with the. Depending on what I need to do, if I need to achieve collagen induction, induction therapy, then I do. I do the uh, the derma pen, micro pen, whatever the uh, micro needling device, and then I apply the mixture I'm preparing uh, uh, topically, massage it in, and that's it. So because I want very nice, even distribution. So this is how I do it. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Okay. What if we don't do anything about skin aging? We are going to age, right? And not only women age, even men age. And this was the situation 20, 30 years ago. We were subjected to this kind of aging. The question is, can we do something in order to stop or revert the signs of aging? Yes, we can do an anti-aging program. And the concept here is to do a series of procedures and then ask the patient to revisit us three or four times per year. We do procedures which are mostly associated with no downtime. It should be of reasonable cost because the plan should be paid on a monthly basis instead of per visit. So it, they are not going to feel the burden. No high expectations because when we are doing something to keep the skin looking good um, or uh, prevent the aging, 
it's not like if someone is having scar and we are trying to treat the scar. When we do our procedure, this client is going to look at the mirror every five minutes to see if the scar is there or no. But when we are doing something anti-aging, uh, the expectations is just to keep the skin in good shape, which is going to happen. So this is a very important key. And in 10 years, patients will look the same or even better. If we look at those two photos, it is for the same person. And I think if I ask you which photo the patient is younger, I think we'll all agree that the patient on the right is, uh, or the, when she is on the right, this is the younger. However, this is not the case. This was the, uh, the patient in 2012. And three years later, this is how she was looking with implementing the program I discussed before. Uh, after three years, uh, she's looking much younger than three years ago. So it is not only that we stopped the signs of aging. I think we all agree that we reverted back how the skin is looking. Here she was 68, and then when she's 71, uh, she's looking much better. Let us look, look at her neck and how it is becoming much smoother. This is her skin and the wrinkles. And I think we agree that it's looking much better. The, the, her left cheek, and we can see the elastosis and the loss of collagen and how much it improved in three years. This is another uh, patient and she was looking like this in 2012. Look at the quality of the skin. And in 2015, the skin quality is much better. I think we all agree on that. This is another patient in 2012. And then in three years, she's looking better. And in uh, five years, she's looking even better. So she is getting older. However, her skin is looking younger. Now, very important thing. This patient came after the, the plan, the rejuvenation plan. We did three sessions and we did all the aspects and so on, but she said, I did not get any improvement. So I told her, I think you did. She said, no, no one is commenting. No one is saying that I'm looking better. I told her, okay, let us look at the photos uh, and see if you are right or what happened. And this was her photo before. So I think we definitely see a significant improvement, but when the improvement is happening gradually and slowly, it's not easy to realize. And that's why documentation is becoming very important because when the changes are happening slowly, it is very easy to skip noting. And that's why it is vital to document, it's vital to take photos in order to have a reference to the situation before we started the treatment. So, Again, it is really very important to remember whenever we are touching the skin, that the skin is composed of three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, the subcutaneous fat and tissue. We have to examine each of those layers. And if there's any structural defects, we need to work on it in order to improve it so that we are achieving rejuvenation. Rejuvenation means the restoration of the structure and the function of the skin. So, uh, this was my presentation, and then I got some questions. Uh, Marina asked me to uh, uh, make sure that we covered during the presentation. So uh, the first question was overall skincare, microneedling, dermatology uh, would be beneficial. So I think uh, that was covered and answered, and uh, uh, microneedling and uh, improving the quality of the skin is part of a big plan. We just need to understand which layer of the skin is targeted by any technique we are doing. Microneedling will stimulate the collagen. It is not going to improve the epidermal barrier function. So we need to have something to improve the epidermal barrier function. It's not going to tighten the skin. So if there is skin laxity, we need to have something to tighten the skin. Or we, if there is volume loss, then we need fillers. If there is dynamic wrinkles, we need neurotoxins. So it is really very important to make sure that uh, we are having something in our uh, portfolio for each of the uh, uh, layers of the skin and each problem the patient might have. Uh, what is your favorite dermatology tool for helping skin? I think this was covered. What are the side effects of skin with certain medications and vitamins that cannot be stopped? Uh, now, 
when someone is taking anticoagulants and you are going to do injectables for them, I don't know how come that I read in many presentations and in many uh, uh, product training that they should stop the aspirin or the anticoagulant. This is nonsense because those people who are on anticoagulants, they are taking it for a reason, a serious reason. If they don't take it, they might have serious health issues and problems, which are not as significant, I mean, which are more significant than having some bruises. So if someone is on anticoagulant, we need to address and communicate with them that they might have bruises. They will have bruises, actually, if we do for them fillers or maybe Botox or whatever. And they should be okay with it because we don't have an option. We cannot stop the anticoagulant because we don't, the patient, we don't want the patient to bruise. Let them bruise. If they don't want, then we can do nothing about it. I have patients, I'm injecting them with toxins and with uh, fillers and with PRP on daily basis. And many of them are taking aspirin. So I just tell them, you are going to bruise and that's it. They accept it if they don't want, if they have an event, we'll postpone it till after the event. But we don't stop uh, those medications because they are, take, they are, they are being taken uh, for uh, a serious reason and we cannot stop them. So I think this is uh, uh, this is uh, yeah, just makes sense. Uh, my approach on treating scarring and pigmentation of the skin types four and darker. Uh, I think the microneedling is an excellent tool. Whether it's microneedling or my, microneedling very frequency, it is really very good. It is very safe in all skin types, even uh, types four and darker. Uh, when we do the microneedling, because there is no heat associated, so there is no risk of hyperpigmentation, and we can get transcutaneous delivery of the bleaching agent like hydroquinone or uh, uh, tranexamic acid or whatever. So this is my approach in this case. Of course, also I work on improving the epidermal barrier function, as I mentioned, because if I prescribe something uh, topical, with bad epidermal barrier function, it's not going to go through, it's not going to be absorbed. So working on epidermal barrier function restoration is a vital step in any procedure I'm doing. Now, the last question was, what strength of numbing cream would the doctor choose and how long would it uh, keep on the skin before the microneedling? Actually, this is one of the best uh, options uh, I am working with, which is the... Uh, uh, this combination of uh, an aesthetic where it is it is really uh, working very very well uh, so this is called blt uh, composed of benzocaine 20 percent lidocaine six percent and tetracaine four uh, percent and uh, uh, this is a combination which is, it can be compounded in the pharmacies and sometimes it is available uh, as a ready made, but usually it is compounded. And many, many minimally invasive uh, skin procedures such as microblading, microneedling, and laser resurfacing involve the use of BLT cream. It is powerful enough to rapidly numb the skin with more uh, sustainability than the OTC uh, sustainability uh, than the OTC numbing products. And uh, usually I keep it for 20 minutes uh, on the skin. And after that, uh, I can just uh, wash it out, remove it and start the microneedling. And uh, in many cases, 20 minutes is going to be enough. Sometimes you don't have anything but the EMLA, which is lidocaine uh, 5%. It's a bit weaker. So in this case, I apply it uh, for 20 minutes under occlusion, and then I reapply it for another 20 minutes under occlusion, and then it works. But the uh, BLT is my favorite, and it is really working very, very well. It is available in Toronto uh, in some compound uh, uh, pharmacies or pharmacies which compound medications, but it needs prescription. So uh, your um, uh, doctor can prescribe it uh, without any problem. So those are the things which uh, uh, which I, I I needed to cover, and if there is any uh, questions, 
I'll be very happy to answer them. Do we have any questions, Marisa? Not yet, but let's give it a minute. Uh, hi, Marissa. Hi, Dr. Badawi. It's Wasan from We Inject, and I just want to take this opportunity to, first of all, say thank you to Marissa for setting this up, and thank you to you, Dr. Badawi. Um, this was most inter interesting. It was super wonderful. Both Alex and I uh, have been listening, and uh, I just want to thank you for a, a wonderful presentation and for your time today. Of course, no problem. It's a pleasure to be with you, and hopefully it's going to be you know, uh, just uh, giving some uh, ideas to improve the outcome of what we are doing. Um, I feel it is, uh, it is really nice to, to exchange experience and to give some, um, you know, ideas to do things in a better way. And I would be very happy to always hear from you any questions in the future. Uh, uh, Marisa and uh, Marina are having my contacts and, uh, uh, they can share it with you. If anyone is having any question, I think I, I would be very happy to answer. Uh, we have one question here from Agatha. Can we speak about melasma above the eye and lips? What is the best treatment? Yeah, uh, melasma is a chronic disease. So it's really very important uh, when we are dealing with something to know its nature and what should we expect out of it. So I always say once melasma, always melasma. Till now, there is no cure for the melasma. And when the patient is coming and I tell them that and they feel frustrated and unhappy, I tell them it's just like if someone is having uh, uh, hypertension, high blood pressure or diabetes. We never heard about someone who's taking the medication for one month and stop it. The same for melasma. Our objective always is to try to lighten the pigmentation uh, to try to induce remission of the melasma, but under certain circumstances, it's going to come back. So we are supposed to be uh, doing something bleaching. Uh, laser is not my favorite because sometimes the, there is refractory hyperpigmentation and the pigmentation can increase after using the lasers. My uh, preference is to use something like microdermabrasion or something to improve the epidermal barrier function a bleaching agent and sunscreen. Because with those procedures, at least we don't have risk of more darkening. When we are improving the epidermal barrier function, then we are ensuring that the bleaching agent or the lightening uh, product is going to be better absorbed and more effective, be more effective. And then when, when we are using the sunscreen, then we are ensuring that it is not going to get darker. We have to know that melasma is affected by two main things, hormones, which we cannot play with, and ultraviolet uh, exposure. And ultraviolet is not uh, in the sun only. It's not in the sunlight only. Even the daylight lamps are emitting ultraviolet. And this means that people need to apply the sunblock even indoors if they are staying in daylight lamps. And this is a fact many people are not realizing. So there are three important conditions in order to have successful usage of the sunblock. Number one, the SPF has to be 30 and above. So all the skincare products and the makeup products which are having SPF 15 and 20 useless, are useless. So the minimum SPF effective is 30. Number two, it has to be reapplied after two hours because after two hours, it's gone. Regardless, it's, it's SPF. Whether it's 30 or 50 or 100, after two hours, it's gone. Number three, it has to be applied indoors if you are staying in daylight lamps. So this is regarding the sunblock. Of course, it's challenging to use a sunblock uh, for someone who is wearing makeup and so on, but that's why we have now products which are having mineral powders, like the Sun Forgettable, which I really love, uh, because with a brush, we can, it can be applied over the makeup without any problem. So I'm using the sometimes microneedling in order to enhance the absorption of the bleaching agent. I'm using definitely something to improve the epidermis, like microdermabrasion, hydrodermabrasion, silk peel, and those things, uh, plus the bleaching agent, which can be hydroquinone, 
I know it is having some limitations now regarding the prescription and so on. Tranexamic acid is good, kojic acid is good, but uh, hydroquinone is what I have used for many years and it's working uh, very well without any problem. If it is not available, then we have kojic acid and we have the now uh, tranexamic acid. There is a brand called uh, maybe SkinCeuticals, which are having tranexamic acid uh, uh, as serum, which can be available. Uh, th those are my recommendations for treatment of melasma, whether it is on the eyelid, on the lips, or any uh, um, else um, in the anywhere else in the face. So I hope that answers uh, your question again. I can also talk personally as somebody who has melasma. Um, the best thing is staying out of the sun and that's not what anybody who has it wants to hear, but heat will exasperate it for me, the sun very much so. And if I do any kind of treatments above the lip, it makes it worse. So for me, it's a cocktail of hydroquinone or arbutin. I use um, exfoliators morning and night or one or the other, and then sunscreen during the day. And as Dr. Badawi says, I use um, the Sun Forgettables, the color science brush over top of my makeup so that I am reapplying my sunscreen, just makes it a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, for the under eye or the over eye, a set, an eye cream that contains a little bit of retinol will help a little bit with the exfoliation, but it is a cycle. It's just always going to be coming back. Yeah. Thank you, Marisa, for your input. Great. Any more questions? Okay, uh, yeah. so if there are no more questions, so uh, thank you all for being here uh, till now. And uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, I think the presentation is going to be recorded. And uh, if any questions came up, please feel free to contact me and uh, I would be very happy to answer any questions you might send. In your practice, if there's anything I can help in any challenge, uh, again, I would be happy to uh, try to help at any point. Thanks Amazing. Again very much. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Very much. Okay. Have, Have a, a nice great day. weekend, everyone.